go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, I just want to say these facilities are great. Last time I gave this talk, I had to see a chiropractor afterwards from bending my neck around. So uh, this is a huge step up. Um, so welcome everybody to this talk about atomic design and pattern lab. Um, how many of you were in Adam's talk just previously? Anyone? Yeah, a few people. So you got a little bit of an overview of pattern lab. Um, so I'll introduce myself in just a moment, but before I do that, I want to get a sense of who's in the room. So how many of you would consider yourself a front-end developer? It's about a third of the room, maybe. Um, how about Drupal developers? Uh, also about a third. Um, site builders? A few of them, well, yeah, okay, people do all these things. How many of you are familiar with Atomic Design? Almost most people, and then Pattern Lab itself? A few, okay, great. Um, so thank you for uh, choosing to spend your time with me today. Um, I am excited to be talking about Pattern Lab. Let me um, reset that. So, let's see if this works. Yeah, first thing first, who am I? My name is uh, Aaron Froelich. I'm the technical lead at the ILR school at Cornell University, um, a small team. Um, Afro on D.O. I blog at afro.com and there's a couple other ways to contact me there. Um, and also I am a husband of two teenage boys, a father and a builder, a passionate builder. So I might say a little bit more about that as well. Um, I want to give you a, a brief overview of where we are, how we got to this point, and uh, where we're going. Uh, so I'm going to start by reflecting a little bit. Um, sorry. That not go. I'm going to start by reflecting a little bit about um, the history of our industry, and I'm going to walk through a pattern lab implementation as well as how that gets wired to Drupal using Drupal's core course out of the box initiative, also known as Umami or Demo Umami profile. Um, finally, I'm going to step through through a live demo where I will create a pattern and wire it up to Drupal in Umami. So. Uh, so before we get started, let's see, I want to uh, kick off a build at Simply Test. I'm doing this uh, just so you know how to, if you want to install it yourself. Um, and this takes a little bit uh, of extra effort. So I'll choose du Drupal Core 867. I have to bypass the ins installation here, and we'll see why in a minute. So, um, all right, I'm going to have to remember to go back there and trigger it, but uh, remind me. So where are we going? I'll, uh, so just to say a little bit about my experience with Pattern Lab. I started playing with Pattern Lab two years ago before DrupalCon Baltimore. And um, while there, I went to the component-based training that Forum One put on, and I went to Evan Lovely's talk about Pattern Lab at Pinterest. Um, I also met Evan Wilhite uh, from Four Kitchens and got to know a really passionate uh, community working on this stuff. So over the past two years, I've worked on four or five Pattern Lab sites and gotten really excited about this. Um, in fact, it's made me more interested in this work again. So. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is that I feel like best practices are still emerging in this community. Adam mentioned that the Nerdstein way, um, but uh, there is still ongoing discussion, and you'll see today I'll show you a couple different ways to do things, um, and I'm not an expert in this. Um, I am using it passionately, avidly, but um, yeah, somebody in the room, if you have a better idea at any moment, feel free to uh, jump in. So here's a map of uh, where we are right at the moment. And if we, take, if we pull back just a little bit, this is where we're going. Um, so we're gonna try to cover a lot of ground, in other words. However, um, we're not gonna do that at warp speed, right? We're instead gonna use transporters to, plop down, uh, to spot down in a few different places along the way. Um, so, Another way to think about our trip today is as a, a journey or a quest, so to speak. So 
for the next 45 minutes, uh, we are searching for the Holy Grail. Oh, sorry, not that grail. We're searching for the Holy Grail where your design and development work, to, where you make changes to a pattern that is reflected, that reflects your design system, and then both um, works in both your pattern library and your website. So why did this become the Holy Grail? Where have we been in the industry? I'm lucky enough, um, like some of you probably, to have started in this industry 20 years ago. And one of the things that's happened we've seen is that there's been a real growth and maturity. So if you think back to what, this is what it was like for me when I started developing on the web, table-based layouts. Thank God for Macromedia Dreamweaver where you could click on a table and figure out where it was in the code, right? Um, and then um, writing, oh, it was head spinning work, right? Trying to figure that out and it was extremely inflexible. Cascading styles. I remember the, f the first time I wrote a web page, and you know, it might have looked something like this. In fact, I really think it did. Um, any other webmasters in the room? <laughs> I was at a day long HTML class, and I was a webmaster after that. But um, you know, cascading styles, if you remember what that was like, for me, realizing the control, the, the amount of uh, how incredible it was to be able to change a single declaration for an HTML tag on the page and for it to change everywhere at once. This was me, right? But then, uh, as I thought about it, I was like, no, this is it. The power that we had was so incredible. Enter over the following, let's say, five years, PHP, CMSs, Everybody had to write their own CMS at that time. MVC, templating, jQuery came along, Ajax. <clears throat> then 2009, or maybe 2010. Does anyone recognize that? That's from a list apart. Ethan Marcote wrote, I don't know if you pronounce his name that way, sorry Ethan, if I'm wrong, but he wrote that article, a list um, about responsive design. And suddenly, every conference you went to, every video you watched at the time, uh, was teaching you how to do responsive design. And in many ways, what I want to suggest is that, that this was the moment that our industry had to grow up. Why was that? Because if you're like me, you, had, you were pretty friendly with uh, the important flag in CSS. When things got responsive, suddenly the web was not the single uh, screen that we were looking at, right? This was the web. You've probably seen this slide before. And what that meant is that all that complexity that we had been able to ignore up to that point suddenly started causing problems. Efficiency problems, um, lots of CSS debugging, and um, what I want to suggest here is that that untenable mess of styles and interfaces meant that we were required to form better organization, to better organize our code at that point. And I want to suggest that that's actually how systems evolve. That we go from, as complexity arises, simplicity becomes a byproduct because systems themselves select for, life itself selects for this, right? And so, over the last, let's say in this most recent decade, we've been growing up as an industry and systems have become the norm, right? We've moved from pages and the WYSIWYG to patterns and design libraries, now to systems. What, what is a system? A, simply a set of objects governed by rules. Who said that? That was, that was just me, but turns out when I looked that up on Miriam, it was quite close to the actual um, definition. So what do we have? We have um, design systems emerging, material design, atomic design. And so for the rest of our time today, we're going to zoom in on atomic design, which is, uh, as most of you know already, um, Brad Frost's articulation of a way to describe the content of our interfaces. 
that allows us to organize it in ways that are more predictable, flexible, and over time, I would argue, efficient. And so Pattern Lab becomes the expression of atomic design. You see on this slide here, we have a link. This is straight out of Umami. A card, the molecule. An organism which is made up of molecules, possibly atoms as well. And then pages, which are where all of these elements come together. So let's jump, oh. So how do we begin to solve these problems if we want to create um, pattern land? For existing projects, um, the, you start with an interface inventory. An interface inventory, this is the one we did a couple years ago um, at the ILR school. It allows you to explore the many ways that interfaces are expressed on your site. And the reason this is important is because what you notice very quickly if you do this, for most people, is that there aren't consistent ways that it gets expressed. There, you we're expressing our interfaces in too many different ways. And um, the process also allows you to begin a conversation amongst your team where you're creating a common language, and this is extremely valuable. So by doing an interface inventory, you can talk about the things that you have and what their purpose is and what you're going to call them. Whoa. That just happened. So a keyboard shortcut. So for new projects, we often start with a style guide. It might come out of the design comps. Huh. Um, the style guide allows you to also express what's coming in and to begin to create a shared vocabulary of that. I'm sorry for the broken image. But before we do that, I'm going to just jump in really quickly. Oh, I forgot to uh, go back. So I'm just going to kick that off, and then I'll jump over to a local version of it. <clears throat> so if you were going to do this on Simply Test, you would um, select Demo Umami as the inner. And here's the step that required us to use the, uh, that checkbox on the, on the first page, because we have to come in and manually, by choosing that. All right, so that'll run back in the background, and we'll, we'll see. Oh, I'm going to have to put in credentials in a minute. but. Before I do that, I will uh, show you here. So this is Demo Umami running on my local system. This is straight out of the box core Umami. Um, it was created a number of months ago. I noticed when I launched one yesterday, it now has um, this first image is different. <clears throat> Who Has anyone here not seen this? It's new to a few people. Oh, wow, great. So. Just a brief caveat, this uh, Demo Umami came because um, the community realized that when people were going to try Drupal, they needed more than what you got when you um, launched it for the first time. So this is an install profile, a ton of effort by the community, uh, really inspiring. I think Dries talked about some of the photography that went into this. This is all photography taken by Drupal community members. And so now if you want to, if you want to take Drupal for a test drive, people can choose Umami as the way of seeing how it's being used. And also, everything in Demo, demo Umami is core. So um, you can see how core would solve certain problems. We'll come back to, to this section later. But basically, we have a banner towards the top with a link. Um, we have some articles and cards, recipe collections, some marketing info. If I go into an article, all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll give that a second. <clears throat> and while we do, we'll see what's happening. Yeah, that's still installing. Give me 20 seconds while my VM boots.
All right, let's try that again. Here we have an article with featured articles, other featured articles along in the sidebar, and the content of the page. And then the final piece is recipes, as well as the search. Um, so the recipe has some, t some uh, taxonomy information, some prep time, ingredients, and recipe instructions. All right, so this is super great, comes out of the box with Drupal Core. Um, and so heading back to the presentation, right? We can imagine if we were, uh, this is a new project, right? We just got this comp from the design team. So what do we want to do? As a team, we want to come together and we want to start describing what's here. What are the atoms, the molecules, the organisms that make up this site? So here's a, a simple effort I made. Here we have, you know, we have a search box. We have the logo, which would be an atom. Search box would be a molecule. The, the main menu in the header, this whole header section would probably be an organism. And then we have another molecule, um, in this case called the recipe banner, the promoted card grid. Now, one of the points I want to make is that um, these are names that I came up with. Some, get, some I pulled from Umami, um, some uh, from the, the theme or the profile itself, some I made up myself. Naming is hard, right? And so it really helps to have, uh, to be working with a group of team, uh, with a group to do this. You know, there's the old joke, there's only two hard problems in computer si science, cache invalidation, naming things, and uh, off by one counts. <laughs> But um, the point being, um, these can be named anything. And within Pattern Lab itself, which we're going to jump into in just a second, you don't, you're not stuck with atoms, molecules, organisms, layouts, and pages. You can call those whatever you want, and we'll get to that um, a little later on. So if you decide is it, um, you wanted to use Pattern Lab as a team, um, one of the strengths of Pattern Lab is you don't actually, you're not tied to Drupal. In fact, you can start your design process right once you have the comps. You don't have to wait for a site builder or a Drupal developer to even begin building. And some teams have done this. It allows you to do synchronous development. Um, you might come to the Pattern Lab site. You could go to download it. You could download the Twig edition. And you could get started, right? The developer doing that wouldn't even need to know Drupal. Um, there's also a demo. I won't spend a lot of time here, but um, it's good to know. We'll, we'll do the demo. This is Pattern Lab itself. We'll do that with Umami. <clears throat> right. So, it's not working. Why is that? I was going to show you this. Um, to get Pattern Lab running, I'm using Emulsify here for this presentation, by the way, and I'll say more about Emulsify. It's as simple as going into the theme and saying npm start. Right. That's going to launch my version of Pattern Lab. Um, this project's version of Pattern Lab, it's also going to do things like SAS watching um, and um, some other tasks, CSS linting. So that's, that's starting the Pattern Lab server. Image minification, icons. And we're almost there. It's starting to serve the site. Great. Now it should be there. All right, so here we are in Pattern Lab. Again, Pattern Lab is essentially a static site generator. So what are we looking at here? We're on the home page of our demo Umami Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab has some really nice user interface that makes it a great laboratory for doing your work. So for example, it's really easy to change this, the size of the page. So you're not stuck only designing at the desktop and forgetting about mobile. Um, there's even a disco mode. <laughs> um, it has some information where you can show metadata about a given pattern. In this case, we're looking at the home page. It tells us that it contains the following patterns, the site header, the, the recipe banner molecule, the card grid organism. There's actually two of them on the page. It gives you the twig output, as well as the rendered HTML. These also are links, right? So now I just went from, from the home page to my molecule, the recipe banner. 
where's the data coming from? Right? It's not coming from Drupal at this point. This is static data. It's coming from YAML files. So if I come in here and um, so everything in um, in our pattern lab here, all the sorry, I didn't say this earlier. I meant to. Part of the part of the strength is that everything is encapsulated for a given pattern in its own folder. That includes the markup. That includes the um, documentation. That includes the the SCS the SAS in this case. That can include the JavaScript if your component needs JavaScript. Everything is in one place. So for our recipe banner. It's all right here in the molecules folder. Here's my twig file. Here's my YAML for it, right? This is super easy. Come back here, it's already, it's already updated, right? So it's a really nice interface to, to add your styles. And, and again, I'm gonna do a live demo later where we're gonna see that. It's a really nice interface. It's quick, um, it's clear. If you combine it with a strategy like BIM, it, may, it really encapsulates your, your CSS in a really powerful way. Um, and I just read an article about ABIM, which is Atomic Design BIM, that people are advocating for, which gives you, um, I didn't put a link to that later, but um, it allows you to go even further. So, let's see. What else can I say about Pattern Lab? Um, we can walk through the, the sites. You can see I have, um, under my atoms, a lot of a lot of what you see here is coming straight from Emulsify. So you you wouldn't have all this. I didn't do the work for many of these, but a button, sure, I styled a button. Um, text links, right? Molecules include uh, cards. The recipe banner that we were just looking at, organisms, card grid, right? There's also um, Sidecar, which allows you to have variations. So you can see here under our card grid, we have an alt grid. Difference being it's a, it's a different aspect ratio on the image and the order of the items has changed. So in order to do that, under my um, card grid, you see this tilde in the, name, in the title. I don't know if you can see that up there. Yeah, hopefully. By passing tilde alt, it allows me to have um, Variations, in this case, the only thing different is that I'm passing a modifier to the grid called Alt. And that ends up changing the way this gets styled. Um, so they become really powerful as well. So um, one last thing I want to point out about Pattern Lab. I, I did leave the templates in here. This is often the first section that gets dropped. and um, I have not fully used the, the template section yet. This came from um, Emulsify out of the box. And one of the things I want to note here, if I come and look at one of the templates, so let's go to the uh, with sidebar. And then I view pat show pattern info. Here's where I'm going to describe a little bit about some of the gotchas or, or emerging best practices. So what they're doing here is um, they're embedding another template, the default twig template. And then they're, um, they're defining a couple of twig blocks. And this is a pattern you see a lot in Emulsify. What I don't like about twig blocks is that they're, it's unexpected. You don't know what's going to be injected into that block. And that plays out in different ways. It means that you're, like, if the goal is the holy grail, to have a single source of truth, when you use twig blocks, my concern is that... Um, you, you don't really know what's being rendered. So for example, uh, a Drupal twig template might render something else in a twig block, and that bypasses what you have in Pattern Lab. Um, so what I tend to do, rather than taking this pattern, is I'll come in, and for my home page, it's composed of other organisms, right? So here at the top, I have my site header. Then I have my recipe banner. Then a card grid with some modifiers, and um, the data, some homepage content, which I statically coded there. This page itself never runs, Drupal never runs this page. Really what it should be called probably rather than home is demo home, because it's just a demo page, right? Um, I'll come back to that notion that um, 
thinking about what is getting rendered can be a little bit tricky when you're new to pattern lab. So, if I jump back here into the slides, now let's talk about Drupal. So, the strength of Pattern Lab again, in part, is that it's agnostic to the back end. Really? So, but what's getting rendered in Drupal, right? We've got fields, we've got nodes, box, views, forms, entities, layouts, media. That's a lot of things being rendered. And so, <clears throat> It's great that we have a render pipeline that means that when Drupal is getting rendered, it can either go through the default template, it will go through the default template by, um, by default, or you can override that. Oops, <clears throat> sorry about that. With Pattern Lab in the mix, there's one change, which means that if you want to enter the Pattern Lab, then it has to run through a template presenter. Right? And really what I'm focusing on right here is these two pieces. This comes from, um, you know, back in the days we had MVC. MVP, before it meant minimum viable product, stood for model view presenter. Or model presenter view, I guess. No, model view presenter. The role of a presenter, and this I get this concept from Evan Lovely. The role of the presenter is to take the data from the model and transform it for the view. And so what are Drupal templates when you're using pattern labs? Essentially, they're presenters. They're transforming your data coming from your database, and they're passing it into the pattern. So you would never have best practice, and this, this is a best practice, you would never have markup in your theme template folder. Right? All the markup needs to get passed down into pattern lab. So, um, Let's take a look at what, what that looks like in practice. Here's our YAML file, file for our recipe banner. You know, basically what we've got are uh, some, some variables that, also I have this C next slide because in addition to having some variables that get set, we also have um, another molecule being called, sorry, an atom, in this case an image atom, right? So what would we, would we expect to see in our Drupal template here? It would be a presenter that's transforming the data from the database and it passing it through to create these values, which indeed is exactly what we have. This is the, um, let me just show you here in the code. If we come into the banner recipes block, what am I doing? I'm, I'm setting the image source. Media can be a little tricky with Twig. Um, and so some people will handle that with um, pre-process functions. Uh, in this case, I just looked to see what they were doing in Umami theme and grabbed that. <clears throat> so basically, we're digging down into this. We're setting the image source to that value. And then the link. And then we're passing that information into that template. Right? So it gets rendered. Go ahead. Yeah, question. Where are the images hosted? Where are the images hosted? Um, in this case, um, this is hosted on a field in Umami that's being stored, a Drupal field, it's an image field. So the image is hosted in Drupal. Right. Um, you'll see here, I do it on a different one. Um, you can, with a couple of contrib modules like twig tweak and twig field value, which you see this, this field value that's getting piped to comes from that contrib module. Um, you can do some interesting things, like with twig tweak you can pass the source or the Drupal file path to um, an image style to render an image, and it gets piped through then the uh, image styles in Drupal. So <clears throat> the question of, often arises: Where do I make my pattern again? <laughs> right? Because if you think about um, your options, a, a view would be a really common example. What are, views are typically rendering what? They're rendering content through view modes, right? So you might initially, and your design might even suggest that you have an organism that um, does something special, so therefore all that transformation needs to happen in your view template, but then you would be bypassing all those other settings. So really what you want to do is you can do anything special. Let me just show you what this is what um, Emulsify does. They have a view template for the unformatted. And then they just take four row in rows, and they set grid content to the row content. 
which means that when that renders in Pattern Lab, it's actually going to be rendering the card in this case. So if we go into the content and we see this card common, so that, that view by calling row.content is essentially delegating that down to the card. And the card transforms the data into the expected interface that gets rendered in Pattern Lab. So um, where this gets a little bit tricky is um, you end up doing you, you end up doing more transformation than, than you might otherwise need to when you have a full separation between Pattern Lab and Drupal. What do I mean by that? What does Core Umami do for on the homepage here? How did they get this? This block here. Any guesses? Anyone guess how they get this content on the page? We're talking about the one card and the two cards here. We've got an article and two recipes. Blocks? Yeah, it's a block. What's in the block? Uh, an image, a link. The block is rendering a view. It's actually a view block. And it's rendering a view with an attachment. Right? So if I were writing, if I were coding the back end of this, that's not how I would code it. But in the case of Umami Pattern Lab, I wanted to just keep it the same. So where do I need to transform that data? In this case, I have to do it within the views block, right? So I went in and figured out this is called views block promoted I items. Just qu quickly, this is not something that I like doing, but it works. So I run, I, I can uh, run, Twig Tweak allows me to run the results of a Drupal view. So here, I, I'm just merging two arrays together. One of them has the promoted items block, and the other has the promoted items attachment. And then I can set my classes, and I can pass it into grid content. What you see here is that in this case, I'm calling another um, Twig Tweak function called Drupal Entity which gives me the view mode. And the reason I needed to do this was uh, one of those views is rendering the card common and the other is rendering the alt view mode of that. So, th so um, a better way to do this if I were writing the, uh, the back end is I would probably have a, a block here with uh, two entity reference fields, right? One of them's gonna render an article, the other's gonna render, and then they could do more of them as well. You could have a promoted grid where the first item was always large and you could have 10 items after it. Might be your news landing page. Um, so anyway, um, getting back to that idea of trying to figure out what's getting rendered, um, and basically, the, where I always come back to is where does the markup hit? Where does the markup for any given element hit? Because that's what I want to be, since all my markup is in Pattern Lab, unless it's a contrib module or something that I'm not, that I've just installed and I don't have any templates that are mapping the data, um, then um, that's where it's going to be. So for a view, it's going to be rendering um, usually a view mode. For a media entity, uh, it's going to be rendering an image. Um, so let's see. Let's dig into some additional examples. And let me just switch right now because we, we have some time to do a live demo of this. So let me go in. Oh, I didn't show you yet. <laughs> this does actually get rendered out in... Um, I have my Pattern Lab version of Umami running. And that's not what I want. All right, so here we, uh, the difference between these two URLs, this has the PL in it, so this is running through Pattern Lab. Um, and it looks pretty good, but that's what, kind of what we would expect because our Pattern Lab looked that way, so, and we saw the data mappers. Where we haven't, I, where I didn't finish was here on the recipe page. So what I didn't, I didn't get to, to finishing this section, and this is what we're gonna do together. Okay, so it's an ingredient list. So um, we've decided from our comp that we're going to make an ingredient list. What should that look like? If I come here and look at um, the same recipe on core umami, there's our ingredient list. There is a background on that. You can see it. Great projector. So, all right, well, let's just copy those. So my steps are first to come up with a name. So um, 
ingredient list it is. So where am I? I'm not in my Drupal templates folder. I'm in Pattern Lab. We're going to do this first part all in Pattern Lab. It's a molecule. So I'll create a new folder, ingredient list, right? Uh, it's going to need some markup, right? So, it's a twig file. Uh, right now, we'll just put, uh, let's go ahead and do this. So in our twig template, we're going to have a loop, right? The ingredient list, oh, it's got a label. So let's do, and then um, let's see, we'll make a wrapper for the items. Items. We'll do this BIMI. And within it, within the items, we'll have a for loop um, for item and items. Uh, we'll have another div class ingredient list item. And we will render the item. Right? Okay, so now we have a twig template. Let's see what happens when we go back to our pattern lab. Uh, do this here. I don't. Know. Sometimes I have to. I have to open it. No, it's already there. All right, nothing. Why is that? Oh, we need some data. Let's create our data. Our oops. Ingredient list. Uh, YAML. Ooh. And in here, let's grab these, this ingredient list. Oops. Oh, that's funny. It, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, not there yet. Let's go ahead and restart. And while we're doing that, we're also going to create a CSS file. Ingredient list of CSS, right? problem. Doesn't like our twig file. Live demos. What do we do? Oh, we didn't end our for loop. Oops. That might have been why they didn't show up. Now it's happy. There we go. There are items. All right, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna save a little bit of time by going into Core Umami's um, styles so that we don't have to write all those out, and we find that here in Ingredients. So let's just copy if that's uh, this is. Let me put it on the other side. Now we don't like to hard code, I typically don't hard code margins or paddings either. I, I personally use compass vertical rhythm, but we're going to avoid that for the moment. Um, but background colors are definitely something we don't want to be hard coding. And let me show you, if I come here on the global, you'll see uh, this is our uh, pattern lab of all the colors for the project. And I was able to grab these straight out of, um, 
straight out of the design style guide from Drupal.org. So in this case, I happen to know we want Seashell, but um, the way that there's two files within Emulsify, we've got colors, color vars, which shows up on that home page, and then colors used. And I kind of like this pattern of doing things. That's not the right one. Um, because then it allows you to give a name for a color that's used, and if, it, if you want to change it all over the site, you come to one place, rather than having to go through and find that color name over time. So uh, in this case, you can see our ingredient list background. That's what we want. So our background color. Let's go back. Well, the background color happens to be the same. Let's just take a quick look and see if that's true. <coughs> Yeah, right. it happens to be the same color as the page, which is why you didn't see it there. But um, going back to our ingredients here in Core, okay, what else do they do? They have the field label. That looks like a heading to me. So I'm going to have, um, for the label, I have a mix-in, heading large. Oh, we don't have a label there. Hmm, why is that? Oh, we didn't define it yet. That looks right. Looks pretty good at least. Oh, but it's underlined too. I have a mix in for that. All right, there we go. All right, so what about our items? Here they are. Some margin, some padding, a color. Void column, I'm just gonna leave that color variable for now. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. What else is there? Oh, it's two columns, right? When do we go into two columns? In this case, they have it um, here, 60, is that right? No, we're There it is. I'll just copy these two. And here I have, um, that's, this is for the whole ingredient list. I'm using uh, breakpoint. So for medium and larger, create two columns. Great. Okay, that's not what I expected. Um, what I'm noticing here is the ingredients, they're coming up, so hmm. Really, we don't want the whole thing to become two columns. Right? I'll just remove that out. We want just the items wrapper. Whew, okay, that looks pretty good. We got it done, we got sign off. Okay, let's move it into Drupal. Uh, in this case, what it, what are we going to be rendering in Drupal? Uh, go to four. Let's take a look. Oh, I have to do that again. Since switching monitors, we moved it. Oh, it's a it's a field. Okay. Let's create a field template for that. So that that is our presenter. So I come into our Drupal templates folder, go into the fields. Okay, there's, so what, one of the things I often do here is I have develop going, the first thing I'll do is just say, okay, what's my context? So this is, um, what's my context that's being rendered here? I'll probably have to clear cache for that to work. So we'll do that. Sorry, rebuild cache. And coming back here, let's see what happens when I re-render that page. What I expect to see is that Kint output here on the page telling me what the context of that is. And there it is, okay? What do we have? This is the render array inside. We have items, and each item has content and attributes. Okay, so that's helpful. So what do I want to do here in my within my field? Um, I'm just going to keep kenting for a little while. Um, I'm going to transform those items. So 
four items in items. Uh, sorry, four item in items. Won't make the same mistake as last time. Make sure we close that. Let's, uh, well, so we know item.content. Uh, sorry. That's an array. Oh, it's got a context. Okay. So, um, context. What are we doing on time? Okay, about five minutes. Good. Perfect. All right. So there's a value. So I could keep going that way, but I'm actually what I, I'm going to shortcut a little bit here because I know that's not really what I want to do. I'm going to be setting up a variable, an array, to hold this. I'm going to call it ingredients. Right? And I so I just instantiate it as an empty array. And then here, I want to merge into that. So I can copy that. And I want to do, in, this is how you merge in Twig. Ingredients, um, you pipe it to the merge filter. And what we merge in um, is, the, uh, is, is what we want. In this case, what I, what I happen to know, the shortcut I'm going to take here, because I could keep digging into that array. It happens to be value there. But I, I know something else. I can just say item.content. And then I can pipe that to render. Handy little trick, right? So then let's just kent here now, ingredients. And if I did all my syntax correct, I have two kents in there. We got some markup with a string, perfect. That's exactly what items wants, right? So now I'm gonna pass it into pattern lab. I do that by uh, using the include And this is a molecule. Um, it's called ingredient list. Ingredient list. Twig. And what do we need to do? We need to say with our variable here was called items. And we'll set it to ingredients. Let me get those kents out of there and let's just see what happens. Woo! <laughs> Ingredient list.twig is not defined. Molecule. We have more than one of them. And there we go. We're now piping that through Pattern Lab and it's getting rendered to the screen. So um, I hope that I didn't go too quickly there. I have a couple more minutes. Um, I want to show you some additional resources. Um, the Drupal Twig Slack, I'll just open it up because it's so helpful. There's a few people on there, uh, including Mark Conroy and Evan Wilhite who are, and Darren Fisher, who answer a lot of questions. And I will say that a, a very high percentage of, the, percentage of the questions are about Emulsify. It really has um, kind of captured a lot of the enthusiasm and energy. That's Four Kitchens, Pattern Lab based theme, if you haven't seen it. So, um, but other things happen that are, oh, by the way, let's just, oh, I would have had to finish. I'm just going to see if that rendered. Um, other things that happen here, including links to recent, so Mark Conroy, who worked on Umami, um, and now works at Anertech, or, and he's constantly posting new pattern labs. He did three or four in the last two weeks that he's deployed. So this, these are fully working pattern labs. It can be really helpful. He blogs. I have his blog here. Uh, yeah, Emulsify, Mark Conway's blog. He blogs and with some really helpful info. Um, yeah, so I highly recommend joining the Pattern Lab channel. Um, I blog at afro.com. Um, one of the things that uh, recently I blogged about, which is kind of fun, is... I love the idea that using paragraphs, you can um, you can use paragraph bundles, your components as configuration entities for views, which is pretty cool. So an example would be, and I blogged about this, creating paragraph entities for dynamic dynamic content. 
those values in our data presenter where we're mapping it to, to Drupal simply become arguments that we pass to the, to the view. And then we can pass that result into Pattern Lab, and it just works. Um, so here on this, in this blog, these up next articles are simply, um, this is a paragraph component I created. Um, so anyway, that's just one fun thing that I recently blogged about. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, this didn't come up in the last talk, but there is a talk later today with the uh, Penn State folks, um, web components. Uh, we're really excited about web components and we're considering them at ILR where I work right now because it really does allow you to have a distributed design system that all of your web applications or mobile applications are consuming and using. So um, Bolt is just one of them. Um, this is Salem Gawari's project. Um, and he has a talk at Drupal, Design for Drupal in Boston last fall that I highly recommend watching. Um, and um, Bolt is the first I've seen where it is web components with Pattern Lab. Uh, I think that's a pretty exciting frontier uh, for the future. Um, last thing before questions, I just want to say, you know, for, for those of us who are either new or have been doing this for a long time, you know, we've been pushing pixels around screens, some of us for decades. And only recently did I realize how great it is to take that energy and move it into the real world. Um, and so the last couple of years, um, I've been building things. Uh, I built this meditation space in my house. I've been using a lot of reclaimed wood. This reciprocal roof gazebo. Um, this was my office, my cubicle office at work. That's what it looks like now. Right, and I can't tell you how much my life has been enriched um, by, by taking this energy of being a builder and bringing it into the real world. So I just offer that as an invitation for folks. And um, now I'll take questions. Yes? Uh, so I want to make sure I understand. You rebuilt um, Umami with Pattern Lab. Yes. On your own. Okay. Are you going to make that code available to, like, so we can look at the Yes. So the question is, um, if I rebuilt Umami with Pattern Lab, and am I going to make that code available? That was supposed to happen today. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, I've been working with John Pugh at DevShop, um, and uh, we have an Umami instance of DevShop, and my hope is that pull requests into Umami Pattern Lab, this is a live, let me just go ahead and go there, uh, GitHub. Right. This is the GitHub for that project. You could you could download you could um, clone master and get it running. Sorry if the documentation isn't great. <laughs> My hope is that um, because these best practices are still emerging and being discussed. My hope is that Umami Pattern Lab could be a place that the community will actually do some of that work and use it as a training ground. I love how Contenta has been using Umami um, as a way of helping people understand their concepts. Um, that whole knowledge, um, knowledge transfer paradigm is, I think, really useful. So, so yes, um, it is currently um, open source and available, and I hope it will even get better. Um, ideally, what we would have is DevShop running where a new branch, an Emulsify branch, or um, you know, like a Phase 2 or a, a Bolt design system branch could, could um, if they create a pull request against this, it would spin up an environment and be served for people to, to take a look at. Other questions? Yes. Can you create a sub pattern? A sub pattern. Um, well, patterns can include other patterns, and so um, one of the things I was going to show. This isn't what you're. Can, can you explain what a use case for that would be? Like I work for the state, so the overall state has a certain pattern, and then each agency would have its own particular types of patterns, so with slightly varied, a slight variation. Yeah. You can do that in variations, and one of the things that a lot of variations have is, um, sorry, a lot of components have is conditionals to check if a certain data is on that. And if the data is not there, it won't show it. But a good example would be if your cards have additional data for one property, you could just check and see whether a value has been set for that, and if so, render it um, differently than you would. Uh, so that's the most common example I've seen of that. Um, I don't know specifically about sub patterns. I mean. Um, so you could create an NPM package. I've seen teams do this where they load their pattern lab into the node modules directory and then render all their Drupal templates through that. And you could distribute that out as a package to different properties you're working on and then add to it. 
But I think this question of creating reusable components um, that are, um, you know, really behave in predictable and efficient ways, I, I think that's um, a really interesting part of uh, the discussion right now and where web components themselves actually, I think, have a leg up. Um, but I did want to show you one thing. In terms of keeping things dry, um, within core here, there's uh, card common and then there's the card common alt, which alternate, uh, uh, changes the view mode of the image and stuff. And so you can do this in our alt rather than redefining all this. Um, what I've done, right, is I've just included, I only recently figured out you can do this. I just included that theme template. So, and then I passed in a different modifier, in this case, alt. Right? That's what gives me what I need. That way I'm not repeating all that, um, all that data mapping that I'm doing here in case a field name changes or we have a, some better way of doing things. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yes? If you, uh, if you have your pattern lab and then you make, and then you make a chain, like what the example you did, right? Yeah. You may add like a description or something like that, right? Yeah. If you've already used that in your site, right? Yeah. Will that automatically become available to the site? It, not only that, it is what is being rendered in Drupal. So a good, um, I can go to a site that I worked on. And, um, you know, I've been uh, the only developer on my team for a couple of years, well, for the last year while we were searching for someone, and we recently hired them. Uh, so a lot of the things I was excited on and working on, um, you know, they, they, uh, they're not as robust as I would like them. So I'm going to show you this, even though it's not perfect. This is a website, Gig Economy Data. It looks at um, the future of work, uh, co-sponsored by the Aspen Institute and the school I work at. So they ha there's a Pattern Lab instance here. Um, and um, this is not, you know, we, we did a lot. Um, when I, but this Pattern Lab here, I, I use Platform SH a lot with Pattern Lab because it's really easy to just modify that composer, uh, sorry, the, um, the build file, the um, environment, um, what is it called, platform.yaml file, and, and then up on the server it builds Pattern Lab and it um, aliases those paths. So at slash style guide, I have our living Pattern Lab, but it's rendering the same templates here that Drupal is rendering, exact same template. So if I add something to a pattern, not only is my Pattern Lab using it, but my Drupal, Drupal is using the same one. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Other questions? I didn't say this, but it's totally agnostic. There is a team that, um, that I know of that was um, at least claimed that they were rent using the same pattern lab for both uh, WordPress and Drupal. I looked for an open source version of that and it, um, I couldn't find it exactly as was, but the point is, um, for the most part, you can keep Drupalisms out of your front end and then you could drop that templates, that, that patterns folder into another pattern lab and then the work would be taking the, the data, that it's that presenter layer, taking the data from a WordPress database and piping that in, or, or taking it from some other source, using GraphQL and, um, you know, PouchDB, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, there's lots of cool things that could be done um, without ever touching your theme. It just, you'd have to have a way to run Twig in this case, because Pattern Lab supports both Twig and Mustache. Other questions? Great, enjoy your lunch, uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>